I'm angry because being a home health aide, you're not getting enough money. I think we should get paid at least $15 an hour. The cost of living. Hi, it's Mother's Day coming up this week, and today on The Laura Flanders Show, we look at the struggles facing mothers and daughters and grandmothers. First, law professor Kimberly Williams Crenshaw talks about black girls in the school to prison pipeline. Then we turn to the crisis facing elders, and I have a few words about the people who should be on the terror list but aren't. Welcome to our program. In 2014, a 12-year-old girl in Georgia faced expulsion and criminal charges after writing hi on a locker room wall of her middle school. A Detroit honor student was suspended for her entire senior year for bringing a pocket knife to a football game. In 2013, an 8-year-old was arrested for acting out. A 12-year-old threatened with expulsion unless she changed her hairstyle. Those are just some of the stories told in a shocking report released this year by the African American Policy Forum, whose director joins us now. Kimberly Williams Crenshaw is a professor of law at UCLA and Columbia Law School and is a leading authority on the overlapping contours of racial and gender bias. Black women's median wealth is $5. Why don't we care, she asked recently in a webinar series on the crisis facing black women. Crenshaw is executive director of the African American Policy Forum and the Center for Intersectionality at Columbia. Welcome to the program, Kim. Great to have you. Always great to be here, Laura. So where do we start? Um, the Black Girls Matter report, the one about schools over-policed and under-protected. Mm -hmm. The stories were chilling. The statistics, even more so. What were the statistics that you found had been gathered on expulsions? So the statistics on expulsion. So first of all, we were trying to find out what the level of racial burden is that black girls face relative to white girls with respect to school discipline. Um, we already knew that across the country, black girls were six times more likely to be suspended than white girls. So we wanted to know what's happening here in New York City, um, where the center is, and what's happening in Boston. Um, we found that in terms of suspension, black girls in New York were suspended 10 times more often than white girls, 11 times more often than uh, uh, white girls in Boston, but this is the kicker. Um, of all the girls who were expelled in New York in the given year we were looking at, 80% um, of them were African American, 80%. Now, when we wanted to calculate the ratio, um, we found that we couldn't because no white girl had been expelled. So we had to play a mind experiment. Assume, just assume, one white girl was expelled. If you assume white, one white girl was expelled, you get a ratio of 53 to 1. Mm -hmm. That's how much the disparity actually is. And when you went beyond the numbers to talking to girls, and, and I've been, I've had the pleasure or the honor of being part of some of the hearings that you've held. Tell us some of the things that kind of put meat on the bones, put flesh on the bones of those numbers about how the experience for black girls in high school is these days. What are they going through? Well, and so one of the things that we were trying to get at in talking to the young women, we talked to women who had been separated from schools, women who had been pushed out, who had been expelled, and who in other ways were not able to complete their education on time. Because we wanted to get a sense later in their lives what kind of factors they thought were significant in pushing them out. So they told us that uh, zero tolerance schools, schools where there's a heavy emphasis on punitive measures, punishment, rather than active intervention, that those kinds of schools were schools where they didn't feel safe, um, sometimes they didn't even want to come to school because they had to go through metal detectors. Some women just felt like it would, would trigger certain responses. Well, let's talk about particularly that. Particularly those who had trauma. Yeah, yeah. Why, why, would be going, why would going through a metal detector 
be a big deal. So to go through a metal detector, and we're talking about adolescent um, women, um, their feeling was that first of all, they're being surveilled. Um, they are being looked at. They have to take off layer after layer of clothing to make sure that they're not carrying something. Just the process of having to, to take off their clothes, to um, be at the center of everyone's attention, subject to cat calls, comments, things like that. It was, for many of them, they said it's like sexual harassment. It just didn't make us feel good. And some days we weren't up to it. That's basically just the minimal stuff. Other things that they said were that, you know, sexual harassment was something that they had to face. So one girl who had been suspended many times said that her first suspension happened when a boy was uh, hitting her and she asked him to stop. He punched her in the face and they both got expelled, mm. uh, suspended. Mm. Um, so sexual harassment is not something that zero tolerance policies seem to apply to, mm -hmm. right? Um, they also talked about the fact that there really were no services, no counseling uh, resources that helped them deal with some of the conflicts that they had with other girls or conflicts with other people in the school. One girl who never did get into a fight said she stopped going to school because she knew that eventually she would. One has to defend oneself and there weren't really any in, uh, resources to help them. And then finally they said that if they they knew um, that they needed some kind of help. The best way to get it was to show face, to act out. So in, a, in an institution that's based on discipline, to get resources and attention, one has to become a disciplinary mm -hmm. problem. And you're famous for having coined the term intersectionality, the overlapping issues of, of race and gender. Explain how that plays out in that scenario. I mean, on all girls subject to sexual harassment, on all boys, particularly boys of color, subject to special surveillance? Yeah, so, and, and this is, I think, a wonderful opportunity for us to think about how our school policies are not intersectional. So we start with the fact that many of these zero tolerance schools are schools that are in um, uh, largely uh, minority neighborhoods, largely low income neighborhoods. So the actual burden of zero tolerance policies overall is more targeted uh, to schools of color. Then inside those schools, you have gender and race issues going on. So um, one of the most common reasons that black girls were suspended was because of defiance, mm -hmm. right? Defiance is a subjective uh, offense. It's, it's not a rule. You, you know, it's not something you clearly violate. It's in the eyes of the beholder. Well, you take the fact that African Americans in general are seen as being far more aggressive, uh, far more likely to break rules, far more threatening. That's what we've learned over the last year with all of the killings that have happened with police saying, I feel threatened. Right. Well, the threat attaches to black bodies. Mm -hmm. But then women who are seen as acting in a gender non-conforming way are in addition subject to certain kinds uh, of, of uh, disciplinary measures. To be a woman who is outspoken and, and who speaks her mind and that may not raise her hand in class, that's an additional element. So you put the gender non-conforming kind of discipline together with the race-threatening discipline, and that gives you a sense about why black girls are disproportionately, dramatically disproportionately, uh, likely to be subject to discipline. So why have you been focusing on this in particular this year? I mean, this is the, your body of work, but this year you have held webinars, press conferences, issued reports, published letters. You mean in the African American Policy Forum mm -hmm. and your colleagues. What's been going on? Well, this year has been a really um, uh, impactful year in ways that have been uh, challenging as well as productive. It's been impactful because uh, the White House has announced a program called My Brother's Keeper that was designed to address some of the issues facing those populations that are most left behind. Um, when I heard about it, I was like, great. Uh, communities of color, particularly uh, African, African American students, are left behind. But the program focuses only on men and boys. And so it gives the false uh, impression 
that women and girls are not also being left behind. They're not also facing some of the same challenges and some challenges that are different. And so many people think that the school to prison pipeline is the, uh, the ideal uh, example of how boys are being left behind. And we wanted to look into that and show that not only are girls facing some of the same kinds of challenges that boys are facing, but they're also facing different ones. In fact, the, the level of racial burden that black girls face relative to white girls is even greater than the racial burden that black boys face relative to white boys. Now the point isn't to say we shouldn't be focusing on boys of color. The point is to say we shouldn't be excluding girls of color because this is a racial burden problem, not simply one that boys of color are facing alone. Now the White House and its allies have come back and said, yeah, well, it's kind of implicit. We're going to include girls. Do you know the first act, the fact that they're not? Well, um, they're two. So it is called my brother's keeper. It's not called our children's keeper. Uh, so it's pretty clear what the message is. And that in and of itself is something that we want to challenge because what you don't name and what you don't measure, um, you generally don't care about, right? right? Uh, so we want to lift the profile and create public will to address boys as well as girls. And the only way that you can really do that is to collect information and actually share that mm -hmm. information. That's why we've done a number of town halls across the country for girls and young women to tell their stories to their families, to stakeholders, to people who can make a difference. And one of the things I found particularly powerful at the one that I was part of was to hear women from Ferguson, Missouri, where Mike Brown was killed. The situation that has caused many people to say, my brother's keeper is right. Uh, boys are up against it. They're getting shut down in the street. They need special programs. To see women from those communities tell their side of the story um, added a lot for me. What did, what did you go with? Well, so one of the things that I think is so dramatic about the Ferguson context is that Ferguson itself, the city of Ferguson, is a, a city that signed on to My Brother's Keeper. They're a My Brother's Keeper Challenge city. And what does that mean? It means that you have to, first of all, uh, sign a pledge to do a public hearing to explore some of the causes and consequences for the negative life outcomes for men and boys of color. Uh, and then you have to propose you know, intervention. So Ferguson actually had such an event. One would think, given everything that was going on in Ferguson this year, that number one on the list would be police abuse. Number one on the list would be the militarization of the police. Number one on the list would be using the community as an ATM you know, to support government. Um, but Mike Brown was not mentioned. Um, police abuse was not mentioned. What was mentioned was reading levels, family structure, you know, the traditional kind of idea that racial disparity, racial inequality is a behavioral problem. It's not a structural problem. And so one of the things that we've been trying to talk about is how the exclusion of women and girls actually undermines the ability to see the structural dimension of the problem. As long as you think that only one gender is suffering, then that's basically saying that it's not an institutional or structural problem. It's a problem with that subpopulation. And so we're going to invest resources in lifting that pop population up rather than dismantling the barriers that the entire population faces. You've gone on, and I wish we could talk forever, but you've gone on to talk not just about schools, not just about policing, but about the economy, about economics, about wealth. And in the webinar that you held this year that was called Her Dreams Deferred, one of the days focused on the wealth gap. It doesn't even begin to capture it. The statistics on black female wealth, $5 is the median black female wealth as compared to something like 42 thousand for white women. Your question was, why don't we care? Mm -hmm. In the time that we've got left, I want you to talk about that. After all this work of yours, what are your insights into why we as a society don't seem to care? And what's it costing us? Yeah. Well, so we've talked about the wealth gap. And one of the things that we try to do is to get people to imagine what $5 of wealth looks like. So we've asked people to tweet something that costs $5. We couldn't even get a Big Mac in it because a Big Mac costs more than $5.
we should say that's African American women with kids. African American, uh, African American women with children have a net wealth actually of less than uh, five dollars. It's the single black women that have five dollars worth of net wealth. Um, I think one of the reasons we don't care is that we don't really understand the difference between income and wealth. So wealth um, is is what your what your assets are after you subtract your your debts. Uh, wealth is what determines um, what happens to you if you have a crisis, what kind of neighborhood you can live in, whether you can afford to buy a house, whether you can provide your children with extracurricular activities, whether you can get them out of the school they're in into another one. Um, wealth basically uh, is your knapsack, it's your cushion, it's what helps you to survive and thrive. Well, when you have the majority of black women being worth $5 or less than that, it tells you that many of the disparities that we're seeing in the community as a whole can be traced back to the negative net wealth of most of the women who are leading the families. So not to have a social justice policy that focuses on the core inequality that explains so many others is number one a guarantee that the interventions that are traveling under my brother's keeper are not going to sufficiently lift up uh, most of the families that that really need support but it also means that we don't understand how deeply the structure of wealth in American society is also a racialized problem and until we understand that we're gonna have these kind of solutions that say well save more uh, marry somebody, um, exercise, um, you know, different kinds of decisions rather than we need to have wealth generating kinds of policies as a way to intervene and, and better the lives of the children that we say that we care about. Why have you dedicated your life to this, Kim? Well, you know, I grew up in a family that was a civil rights family. Every day um, we had to come to the table with some observation about the world that we lived in and some idea about how it could be different. And my family never limited that to just thinking about race or just thinking about race from a male a center point of view. My life was as important as my brother's life. Um, so that's a, just a deeply held value and I, have been trying to think about what kind of tools we need, both in terms of advocacy tools, conceptual tools, to ensure that when we say black lives matter, we mean all black lives matter. We mean that the way in which race has distorted opportunities for us as a people means all of us. So that's essentially my passion. Um, it's important that we be able to articulate this not only against some of the traditional sources of discrimination, but also take up the hard question when our allies, our family members, others don't understand why our politics have to be more inclusive. We need to have the stories to tell them why. Kim Crenshaw, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. We'll put information about how you can be part of this campaign at our website. Every eight seconds, another baby boomer turns 65. The U.S. population is about to be older than it has ever been before, and seven out of 10 of us will need home care. Ai Jen Pu is fighting for the rights of both our parents and the people who'll care for them. In this clip, she introduces a new film called Care that takes us into the heart of that struggle. You're down slowly, 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 slowly. Like that, beautiful. Like uh, embrace yourself. One, two, three. three. Okay, breathe. Remember to breathe. It's the Brian Lair Show on WNYC. And as the number of older people grows, more and more of them will need care, whether it's help with grocery shopping, a ride to the doctor, cooking, getting bathed and dressed even. Home care workers are the fastest growing occupation in the nation as we speak. And by the year 2050, 27 million Americans will need some form of long-term care or assistance. And 
that just means that this work. My name is Ai Jen Poo and I'm the director of the National Domestic Workers Alliance and the co-director of the Caring Across Generations campaign. And I want to encourage all of you out there to support this film because it shines a light on one of the most pressing issues of the 21st century, which is how we're going to take care of each other across generations as we age as a nation in a way that really lifts up everybody's human dignity. I'm gonna do this shirt. Okay. Let me get this sweater. I've been a home health aide since 1989. Take this out first. But I don't have savings. So when Sandy hit, it really wiped me out. Our place was destroyed. And I have an 11-year-old, he had to go live with my oldest son because I'm staying in a hotel through FEMA. This is my last week here. I have to be out because there's no more fun to pay for me to stay in a hotel. Where I'm going, I don't know where I'm going. I'm angry because being a home health aide, you're not getting enough money. I think we should get paid at least $15 an hour, the cost of living. I make $10 an hour. I still have to postpone Tyree from coming home. If he come home, where he coming to? He's not allowed to go in a women's shelter. He's not even allowed to come to the building to even ask the security guard, can I see my mother? That was an excerpt from Care, a powerful new film about the crisis facing elder care, directed by Deirdre Fisher and featuring Ai Jen Poo of Domestic Workers United. President Barack Obama will remove Cuba from the terror list. Great. Does that mean there are slots open? I'd like to suggest that the White House accept nominations. How about mountaintop removal? I know, terrorist is a hard word to define, but say for a moment that we settle on the fairly innocuous definition, quote, the use of violence and threats by non-state actors in pursuit of their own purposes. It's hard to think of anything more violent than blowing the tops off mountains and dumping the slurry into valleys in order to make a quick dollar on the cheap coal beneath the surface. Lethal? Absolutely. High rates of birth defects, cancer, and heart disease have been tracked for years. And last fall, scientists from West Virginia University found definitive proof that, quote, dust collected from mountaintop removal communities promotes lung cancer. Poor health is hardly a surprise, given the millions of pounds of mining explosives, silica dust, and pulverized heavy metals poured into people's waterways and lungs. But that doesn't stop energy companies from lying to protect their profits. Last year, Alpha Natural Resources, the third largest coal company in the country and the leading mountaintop remover, was taken to court and found guilty of illegally polluting streams, creating unsafe toxic waste, and knowingly violating the Clean Water Act, all with devastating consequences for water life and the ecosystem. Alpha is appealing. Threats and intimidation? Well, check. While a growing grassroots movement has been pushing Congress to pass the Appalachian Community Health Emergency Act, which imposes a moratorium, state agencies are still out there handing out permits for mountaintop removal. 
It's more than their jobs are worth to stand up to the powerful companies. So how about that terror list? The late great Latin American author Eduardo Galeano wrote in 2008, every year chemical pesticides kill no fewer than three million farmers. Every day workplace accidents kill no fewer than 10,000 workers. Every minute poverty kills no fewer than 10 children. These crimes don't show up in the news, Galeano wrote. They are like wars, normal acts of cannibalism. Criminals are on the loose, he continued. Quote, no prisons are built for those who rip the guts out of thousands. If the White House won't take your nominations for the terror list, I will. Got a candidate? Write to me and make your case. That's Laura, L-A-U-R-A, at grittv.org. And thanks. week on the show. Journalist Nathan Schneider. The Pope is not the church. Uh -huh. And one person is not the church. The church is much bigger than that. And join me in Chicago for an exclusive report about a group of brave workers. Monday, Monday we start uh, the biggest order. Be part of something bigger than yourself because alone we change nothing but together we can transform the world. talk about what is a real risk from the point of view of those of us who want to make the world a little brighter, a little more wild, and a little better. Am I risking falling into the hype by simply giving up the idea that race still matters? Mm -hmm. So I, I'm, I'm worried about all the posts, the post-racial, mm -hmm. the post-feminist, <laughs> the post-everything. I'm like, are we really post? Is it really real? <laughs> 